me now is Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman from New Jersey. She's a co-founder of the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls, and she's also a lung cancer survivor herself after being declared cancer-free in 2018 and 2019. Congresswoman, really great to see you. Look, I have this odd um, feeling, you know, sometimes when we are doing a, a program as we are on the policy parameters and scaffolding around health care and cancer, sometimes we do seek out people who can tell the story that they're living and that they've experienced because it's so much so important. But I guess the question I want to start with is that there are a lot of people that did not have gone through what you have that have had cancer. And do you have, particularly among your colleagues in Congress, is there a literacy problem when it comes to cancer, cancer survival, what's needed with some of your colleagues because they have not gone through what you have? Well, I think that, you know, cancer is a very complex um, a set of diseases is not just any one kind. I think I don't think any of us really knows the extent to which there's uh, research on every kind of, ca of cancer. I know we are. I, I know we're aware of the fact that there have been um, in, um, improvements in some of the research and some of the findings and the therapies and the medications and the treatments that have come out of it. But um, like I said. There are hundreds of types of cancer, and so I don't think any of us really knows um, about all of it. But what we do know is that early detection on any level is vitally important. And so we need to make sure that uh, people have access to health care and, and that their health care is uh, something that is, is routine so that you can catch things early enough to be able to deal with them. And I think we also recognize and we need to continue to support the research and development of um, new methodologies and therapies and, and medicines um, and approaches that deal with the various types of cancer. Now, you just mentioned routine, and you've talked about your routine interactions with doctors was what gave you early screening and early word uh, of what you, were, you had coming down the pike to, you know, to, to, to beat. Um, what do we do in the country yeah. to give other people routine interactions with doctors? What do we do in, with other countries? No, other people in this country. How can we create oh, oh, that oh, infrastructure oh, oh. so that they too? Well, obviously, yeah. yeah. yeah two, two things come to mind. One is that you got to have the system where healthcare is accessible, affordable. Um, and secondly, you need to educate people on how important it is to have their routine uh, checkups, their routine physicals, so that if anything is there that needs to be found at an early stage is. Um, one of our greatest challenges, though, in, in, in Congress is understanding we've got an obligation to make sure that everyone has access to good health care and that the health care is responsive to the to the needs of all individuals, and that it shouldn't be predicated upon uh, how much money you make or how, how wealthy you are or successful you are, but that good health care is a, a right in this country. It is not a privilege. We're also, I mean, I think your cancer diagnosis, you know, significant portion of that recovery time also came during uh, uh, the hit of this major pandemic. Um, you, you, you've told in a riveting account of your concerns of, of working with colleagues who were not uh, tuned into the science, were even rejecting the science, talking about January 6th, and you yourself, with pre-existing conditions, um, did become uh, afflicted with COVID. Can you tell us a little bit about your concerns and about, you know, share with our audience what you felt about January 6th? So up until January 6th, I had been voting uh, virtually um, through proxy because I was very concerned that people weren't taking the coronavirus seriously, weren't masking up and, and, and weren't cooperating and adhering to, to guidelines. So I did my committee meetings um, virtually and did my voting by proxy. But um, on the 3rd of January, I needed to come down to D.C. to be sworn in. I... Uh, stayed for the what was going to be the certification of the of the presidential election, uh, and it was, and I wasn't that comfortable with staying down there, but I did because I mm. thought that was my part of my responsibility. On January the sixth, my husband and I were evacuated from our apartment really early because we were near the uh, Republican National Committee, and there was a supposed bomb in the alleyway. 
So we were removed from our apartment before I was ready to even go on to the Capitol Hill campus. I went to the office uh, in the Cannon Building. So as I got there, an officer says, you got to leave. You can't be here. You've got to go, to go down in the tunnels. Um, this is too close to where the problem is. So I went down in the tunnel. Um, I was there for a while and realized there was too much close, close contact. Uh, safe distancing wasn't really um, happening down there. And some of the staffers that were down there didn't think they needed to have their masks on when they did. So I said to my husband and my staffer, let's go to the Capitol because we'll be safe there hmm. in the Capitol, the citadel of our democracy. I get there. Um, I'm on the first floor. I'm I needed my pin because I didn't have it uh, because I had left my apartment so fast. And because I was masked up, I said, you know, let me let me make sure I have a pin. So I went and got a mm. pin, was going up to the second floor and decided I would go to the attending physician's office first to check something out. Uh, on my way down the hallway, I encountered the first officer who said, ma'am, you don't want to go down there they're they're coming in and i'm like who what are you talking about and he said you know the protesters are coming in i said well i just need to go down to this this hall here on the left right behind you be a little bit behind you he kind of shrugged his shoulders and went into the opposite direction then encountered another officer who was standing in the hallway that i wanted to get down and he said ma'am you cannot go down there they have breached uh, the capitol and i looked and i could see different colors, shirts and stuff, and, and I could hear a little bit. I said, well, I'm just trying to get down here behind you to go to the physician's office. So he kind of stood there in front of me and let me go down. And as I go down, well, the door started opening up. Come, come here, come, you know, come uh, lock up in here. And I locked up in a uh, one of the small uh, offices. I didn't see things but I could hear things. Hmm. I saw a little bit about what was going on outside because it was a, a small TV, but I didn't see what was happening inside the Capitol. I could hear things like USA, USA and chants, and I could hear scuffling. But I asked the God thought, well, whatever was going on out there, the Capitol Police, they've got this. They're going right. to make sure that we are safe and only to find out that you know, that that wasn't the case. So I was there for a couple of hours and then there was a knock at the door saying, we got to move you. we got to move you. And I'm like, who are you? And I made them show me their identification before wow. I, I left with them. They said, we're going to take you to a secure location. Wow. That's where they took us to the big room with people in it, mass and no right. And and that that is probably most likely where you were infected, uh, in part by colleagues who didn't believe in masks at that and, right. and, and 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 so that must be a very hard thing to you. And I'm glad you recovered, but you might not have recovered uh, given your uh, underlying circumstances. Many people, yeah. I want to tell our audience, many people with pre-existing conditions, into cancer survivors, did not recover. And I want to just acknowledge that. And so I think in this struggle of science and policy and reaching people where they're at, what are your biggest recommendations for what we've got at what blind spots do we need to remove when it comes to public health and cancer? Um, resources. Hmm. We, we, we need resources in both the actual research and development, but in education as well. Hmm. Um, I don't think people uh, pay attention to their body and what it's what it's telling them. You know, they dismiss things. And I was one of them. I mean, I thought that I was having a, an issue with bronchitis hmm. when I was having a hard time breathing, only to find out from the attending physician's office that I had some COPD and, and there's something that they're seeing on my lung. We need to pursue it. And we did. Hmm. Um, and that's how I found out that it was cancer. Right. But we, we, we see all of these commercials on TV about the latest medicine or therapy for different kinds of cancer, but we don't have enough public discussions about right. um, the cancers, the cancers, and how you can do not fear the word cancer. If mm. someone tells you you have it, proceed to find the medical professionals who, who are expert in those areas and who will navigate you through. 
Congressman, just just lastly, one of the other things that you know I know you did that I found um, just so heartening is your refusal to wear a wig, your decision to have your congressional ID photo taken without hair, your empathy for those people in that, you know, which is something that is another dimension of this, which is stigma. And I'm interested in what you were trying to communicate to people who were trying to navigate this. Yeah, you know what, I'm not as, you know, it, it really isn't quite like that. I can't wear wigs. I just, oh. <laughs> I tried, I tried. Uh -huh. and they just looked like wigs on me and I just wouldn't do it. Well, let's and give so you credit I, anyway. I, I, realized, <laughs> I, I realized there must be a purpose, hmm. therefore, in my not being able to wear the wig. So um, I, 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 wore the, I wore the hairless situation. I got a lot of feedback on it. I found it a blessing that people responded to it in an encouraging and inspiring way. And so I said, God, I guess you had your, your way here in that I wasn't covering my head with uh, head wraps or with wigs. Well, Congressman Bonnie Watson Coleman uh, from New Jersey, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and your perspective on what we need to do to, to deal with cancer in this country uh, in a more holistic and healthy way. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss it.